I think that's like the next thing I just wanted to move into quickly was, so you've all now built organizations, right? And I think it's one of the hardest things in the world to do as an entrepreneur is get from that very early stage into building infrastructure in an organization, right? And, you know, very few make it to that stage. So, you know, how many employees do you have at uh, Convene? 450. 450. <laughs> Michael, how many do you have? About 50. How many do you have? Yeah, about 45. Same, 50-ish. What do you have, Gary? 240. Wow. So how do you create that sense of culture now? As an entrepreneur, as the founder, how do you move from sort of that grit, that survive, that hustle into building an infrastructure? What, what did you do to get there, Ryan? You know, I, I can't speak for everyone here, but I think all of us wouldn't be successful nor were our, our companies if we didn't have a, a culture that also defined us. And you know, the thing that keeps me up at night, especially as we continue to scale, is well, how do we scale the culture and the magic that is Convene? Which that DNA, those those seeds were laid when we first started the company. That grit, that entrepreneurial spirit, that will, that how we operated with integrity, how we always focused on our customer. The question is, as you start to scale from four people when we started to 100 to 400 to, you know, we'll probably add 1,000 people in the next 15 to 18 months. How do, you, how do you still keep the special sauce culture that is convened? And I've started to develop a thesis around this, which is for us as a hospitality company, our high bar in hiring is values. It's grit, right? Genuine, relentless, integrity, teamwork. And as long as we can train our organization not to sacrifice on that, and as long as we play offense and defense to protect that, what's been interesting is as we've been adding headcount, like if you look at our employee engagement scores, they've actually been going up, which tells me that we're doing something right uh, and we're starting to attract the right types of people that actually fundamentally believe what we believe at their core, right? They're inspired by what we're doing, but it's more, it's more than that. They're like actually values align with the way we conduct ourselves as an organization. Um, and look, I, you know, is it perfect? No, but you know, we spend a lot of time and energy thinking about that. Um, I spend a lot of time just you know, kind of obsessing, well, how do we scale that? Michael, how about you? I mean, how, how have you been able to maintain such a quality brand around Comstack as you've grown? Well, I, I, you know, as it relates to kind of growing the team, it's like, I think it's a function of two things, timing and money. You know, you need the money to be able to build out the right type of people to build the kind of organization you want. But if you do it, if you get that money and you do it too early, you screw up. Like, there's definitely been a couple hires that we've made that were the right hires for us today, but we hired them when we had 20 people and we just, they, it wasn't, and they, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't empower them to be the, to do their job as, as well as they, as they should have. Um, so it's, it's definitely tying to money as far as building out the right team and, and, and figuring out who the right person is for the right period of time. Um, I think that there's also, as it relates to team, there's like certain people that like are absolutely just have to be so core and believe in what you're doing. Um, there's a couple of senior guys who've been on our team forever who, you know, um, recently, you know, they hadn't had reviews in a while because they, I work with them closely, they get reviews and they get bump, salary bumps when they get them. And I, and I said, hey, by the way, we're gonna give you, give you raises. And neither one asked how much. And one of them said, can we save that money and allocate it to my team instead? You know, <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, like this is amazing. You know, like those people, you can't, I mean, there's certainly like, you can't, it's, hard to, it's hard to hire for that, it's hard to know who that is, but when you have those people, they're just absolutely indispensable. Um, and they just have to believe and, and um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think for us, transparency within our organization is very important. So we try to, you know, share as much as possible so people feel like they're, they're part of the decisions that we're making and try to stay as flat as we can. Um, there's always pros and cons to that because sometimes if you share too much but people don't have the context to understand the news you're giving them, they interpret it the wrong way, you know, but um, how you do that and how you try to maintain that balance of kind of transparency and openness while also making people feel like you've got things under control is always an ongoing challenge. Jonathan, for you, I mean, you're hiring a, a different type of professional than I think a lot of other people. What does that mean? <laughs> no, meaning that <laughs> I've met some of these people. No, you're hiring some, some brokers, right? And, you know, in a sea of brokers, how do you determine 
which ones are right for the square for square foot? Uh, yeah, for brokers in particular are an interesting bunch in general, and then to hire them in particular. It comes back to the stuff that Ryan was saying, right? There's values that we hold near and dear to our heart. We went through the whole values exercise uh, again recently uh, to make sure that kind of everybody's aligned and it wasn't like, this is what Jonathan believes, so hopefully everybody else believes. We you know, did it as a whole organization. Um, and there are core values that matter and we recruit based on that. We make hiring and ultimately firing decisions based on those. Um, like to believe that intellectual curiosity, which is one of ours, is not something that is uh, kind of patented for us, like the average broker hopefully is intellectually curious. Uh, they're willing to go the extra mile. Um, they're willing to take ownership, right? So, and these are all things that you then interview for um, and you make decisions based on that. And that's across both the brokerage org as well as the product and marketing org. Um, because everybody does something very different or within those kind of groups, right? We talk about our three-legged stool. Um, but what makes somebody tick is kind of uh, immutable throughout. Rich, how about you from your perspective, culture? Yeah, I mean, so we're, we're now sort of going through this inflection point of hiring new people. And, uh, you know, now for the first time, I, I don't think I'm getting to the point where I know everyone's name, like right off the bat, because like literally have, you know, five, ten people starting uh, every week or so. So I'm, you know, I'm similar to you guys now when you have several hundred. Um, when it can be scalable, and I used to want to have a hand in every single hiring, even if it's just a quick meet and greet to make sure that they are congruent with our values and you know they're good humans, so to speak, um, that's just not going to be scalable, right? I don't think you're probably meeting with everybody that you're hiring and uh, ditto, right? So that's something that I'm thinking pretty deeply about literally as we speak. Because um, we're all right now in one single office, in, you know, right down here in the Flatiron. So as you scale out multi-office, multi-region, and all that stuff, um, to your point, it doesn't get easier operationally and organizationally as you scale. So that, to me, is the big thing that I'm uh, trying to figure out, frankly. Gabby, for you, I could imagine your challenge also is that you're hiring people in the field, right, that are working in uh, customers, clients, buildings, yeah. as well as on the operations side. Yeah, so right. how, how do you approach culture hiring and what happens? We have this really interesting kind of um, cultural paradigm within our organization where we've got quite quite diverse um, roles. You know, we've got a really strong product team. Um, you know, so you've got technologists and, um, and, and scientists and, you know, and then, yeah, we've got this huge um, army, we call them, the equi army of, of community managers. Community manager. um, and so roughly 170 um, of, of our 240 are, mm. um, are these community management roles. So and, and to make it even harder, so we often talk about the fact that we've actually almost got these different cultures, mm -hmm. you know, operating within the organization. We've been reasonably thoughtful about scaling our culture. We believe very strongly that the culture was core to what got us, you know, as we started to look at global growth, you know, that was a big piece for us is mm. how do we, what, what are we taking with us out of this culture and what are we happy to leave behind? Because, you know, I think you get- It's an opportunity, in, right? In a startup as well, um, and I'm sure we've all been there and I've got the same thing, that core group of, <coughs> of equium stalwarts that are like, they are the keepers of the brand and the culture and, you know, and you need to hire people in that are going to carry that on and kind of carry that flame forward. Um, but, um, you know, equally it was very thoughtful around what parts of the culture are not reasonable to carry forward as we, you know, as, as we hire more people and expect people to work more reasonable hours. You know, I think the, when you're in a startup, you never have enough money to get any of the work done, right? And so the reality is that people get behind. Yeah. <laughs> it's not just me, okay? No, the truth is, I, I'm pretty sure it would be, unless you're just really well funded from the get-go, but, you know, basically you're expecting people to go way above and beyond. Mm -hmm. But this handful of people who have gotten behind this vision, who are going for world domination, you know, and, and they're working their butts off. Um, and, and so how do you, you know, as you kind of grow more people, you kind of, you want to take some of that with you, but not all of it either, you know, because I always say to my team, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? So we need to be doing this at at least at a reasonably sustainable pace. And I always tell my team it's a sprint, not a marathon. <laughs> no, it's a marathon, That's but why run at sprint so speed. Yeah. Yeah. That's I'm really still, what it is. I am smiling right now because like we are living that culturally right now. Um, and you know, we acquired a company recently that was yeah. a startup technology company. And they came in with this like, you know, they've been living 200 miles an hour for two and a half or three years, and now it's like they're assimilating into an organization that's 
thinking at scale and the pace of scale is different than the pace of being an early stage company. And it's am it's amazing. I'm just I'm it's smiling real because it's tension it, between it because yeah, and you need the tension. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Because exactly. product Everyone also moves that. at a different pace than yeah, community yeah. Right. does. Exactly but right. yeah, um, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to steal a page from uh, James Altucher, the, the the podcaster, blogger that I that I respect. So I'm going to throw some rapid fire questions. You got to keep it short because we're out of time, we're running out of time. So. No blockchain, <laughs> no cryptocurrency. VR, AR, AI, No, ML. That's, that's the next video. Um, advice you would give your younger self. Ryan. Be a little more patient. Jeez, that's Michael. exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> and they have to all be different answers though. No, okay. Same? Yeah, same, absolutely. Jonathan. Uh, yeah, don't be scared of f***ing up. Just keep going. Just relax a little more. What advice would you give a first time entrepreneur? Ryan. Don't stop. Like, you're gonna have to will it. Um, I would say, you know, you gotta, you gotta drink the Kool-Aid. Like, you gotta just, you know, absolutely believe it. Even when you're questioning it, you have to, you have to drink the Kool-Aid and you gotta present it to the world all the time. Uh, start before you're ready, because you'll never be fully ready. Are you sure this is what you wanna do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and why are you doing it? Right, because I do think some people just That's do good. it for the That's good, I like success. that. Gabby? Get a, get a customer. Get a customer. Yeah, that's, that's a really good. good one. One book that you would recommend to anybody? Ah, uh, I, uh, all right, I've got some old school books, but Seven Habits is one of my favorites. Classic. I literally have zero time to read, so the only book I read is my, uh, my I'm reading Harry Potter for the first time with my seven-year-old daughter, well, so. It's a good classic. Answer. That's yeah. a good answer. And Daddy Points. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know, the book I'm reading now is a Churchill biography, because he went through a lot of stuff. <laughs> I, I censored it. That's good. I Church, censored that's it. Heavy. So. That's heavy. Michael. For, for an entrepreneur, I'd probably say the hard thing about hard things. Uh, <laughs> he stole mine. There it is. He got me back. Yeah. Uh, I would say uh, a book called Mindset um, by Carol Dweck. Uh, and I just, I think it's, it's really interesting um, you know, just for you as an individual. Um, you know, the journey from founder to CEO, that founder journey is also a life journey. Uh, and I think there's a lot of great takeaways in that book that's, that's, that's worth Great. Okay, one more. I got one more. Uh, one person that inspires you or has inspired you, business, personal, any, anybody that you know that really when you get into that place where it's just really hard, you th maybe think about that person, uh, private you know, moments that really inspire you and help you push forward. I'm going to cheat a little bit, but I've got different people for different moments. Go. You know, so the chair of our board, a woman called Tanya Cox, is incredibly inspirational to me. When I find myself getting really frustrated and impatient, I just kind of, you know, she's just got this incredible way of dealing with things. You know, that, that's one little kind of sound bite for you. But so I, I've got very different people that I think about in different moments where I go, what would such and such do? What would such and such do? What would such and such do? For me, I think it's, it's uh, touching on what we said before, the, that, that wind in your sail that just keeps you going. I think when um, I need a little bit more wind in my yeah. sails. I do think about all the folks who are at Reonomy, who I feel this sort of sense of responsibility, whether it's 450 or 240 or even four, right? You, it doesn't matter, you feel that sense of responsibility because they believed in your true north and your vision. And you know, in a sense, they've entrusted very valuable years of their career and their life uh, in you. So that does, um, I do think about that when I need a bit of a oomph. Who inspires you? My mom. It was an easy one. She was born He's, on the flight. She said that because you cursed, and now she's going to watch it. I guess like, it's just said, sorry, mom, for all the exactly. profanity, right? Are you going to apologize? Yeah. Yeah. For, at first, I like to apologize. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, she was born on an attendant on the Lower East Side and kind of worked her way up, went to business school, was one of the first women to do that. She's you know, 74. She graduated business school and had a successful career. Um, kind of as a female executive before that was in vogue um, and dealt with a lot of stuff uh, along the way. I'm censoring myself now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and she's like a tremendous cheerleader for me, but also uh, tells me when I'm full of uh, stuff. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Michael? I, I agree on there being kind of different people for different yeah, things, yeah, yeah. although um, actually I've got a, a grandfather that I never met, but who um, ultimately was very poor was in an, and who actually was in an orphanage with his siblings and and ultimately built a successful business went to school went to college got you know became and then built a business um, 
in the process made enough money to get his, his siblings out of the orphanage and, and supported them and then built a great company and died very young but actually was able to be a very successful entrepreneur and support future generations through the, you know, in, in some capacity through, this, through what he built. So it was pretty impressive. That's amazing. Uh, look, I mean, I think different people for different reasons. Uh, you have got a lot of amazing mentors that have been fantastic, but I think from an inspirational perspective, I'd have to go with the old man. Uh, you know, small business owner, uh, you know, entrepreneurial to the core. And, you know, he taught me a couple things. One, just some great life lessons, but you always said that there's nothing you can't do if you put the work in, right? Regardless of where you come from, what your educational background is, like if you have a vision for your life and you're willing to put the effort in, and not let anybody outwork you that y you can achieve anything. Uh, and if there's any day where like, I need my number one fan, it's like, that's an easy call to make. It's great. Well, thanks, uh, Ryan. Thanks, Michael, Jonathan, Rich, Gabby. Um, I think, you know, hopefully what you took away from this video um, blog of mine is that, you know, while these are extraordinary founders that have a great vision about how to really bring the commercial real estate industry to a whole new level of innovation, excellence, um, and job creation and what have you, is that what they all have in common is just extraordinary grit, uh, hard work, uh, belief in themselves. And I think the other thing that was really apparent and inspiring to me was their emphasis on the team and their culture. And I think it's sometimes people focus too much on the idea or the website or the platform and not enough on the people that are behind it. And I think hopefully today, you know, you were inspired if you're a founder by these amazing stories from uh, these incredible startups. Thanks very much for watching and stay tuned till the next one.